whoever is listening guys welcome back and welcome to part seven or episode 133 of the man with the plan podcast today we welcome on tyler james who is the co-publisher of inside nd sports part of the notre dame rivals branch so tyler thank you so much for joining us welcome to the show man absolutely thanks for having me i'm glad uh football season is knocking on our door Yep, it's slowly but surely getting here. We got Clemson fall camp starting here in about two weeks as I record this, so we're getting ready to rock and roll. So, Tyler, can you just give us our audience a walkthrough of what your role is with Notre Dame Rivals and just what your day-to-day stuff is? Maybe it's you want to give a behind-the-scenes look on the off-season stuff that you're currently up to or what an average day is like once maybe fall camp hits. Yeah, so... Uh, I am a co-publisher with uh, Eric Hansen. Together, we um, joined the Rivals Network uh, ahead of 2022. We worked at the South Bend Tribune um, for 10 years together. Eric had worked there for like 30 years. Um, it was my first job out of college. Um, and so we have continued that with uh, that coverage with with Rivals at Inside Indy Sports. And uh, we love what we're doing. We're covering football year round I, I think uh most people who cover college football could sort of agree with that but especially at Notre Dame Notre Dame uh football is a year round sport uh so we're covering that all the time and uh get get a little bit of breathing room here in like July but uh once once and even this year because Notre Dame plays in in Ireland to start the year at the end of August um so Notre Dame's gonna be starting its preseason camp or as some people like to call it fall camp at the end of July. So we definitely can't call it fall camp this year. Uh, so uh, we're getting ready for that. We'll have some big stories about some of Notre Dame's most interesting players coming into the season um, with some one-on-one interviews that we've done. Um, and yeah, we, we keep, keep track of recruiting all the time. Um, some basketball coverage during the summer as well. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to get, get things rolling. And um, we, I, I'm more of the, beat writer per se and eric is more of the columnist um, but we like to switch things up and and share those responsibilities if there's something that i feel compelled to write a column about i'll do that but yeah we like to give our readers and anyone that's interested in notre dame as much as many different angles um from the games the practices the personalities around the notre dame football program as we can yeah and i'm sure there are plenty of angles in marcus freeman's first year as the head coach of the fighting irish so 2022, Notre Dame nearly avoids a 0-3 star, and they're able to pick up some quality wins, including Clemson, which we'll talk about later, winning against South Carolina in the bowl game, finishing within the top 25. Can you walk us through what year one under Marcus Freeman was like? I know he had that first game in the Fiesta Bowl prior to this, but Mm -hmm. how did this community embrace Freeman in year one, and what's the excitement level given that this team didn't just it did not necessarily just bow that bow their heads down and say, okay, this isn't our year. They were able to pick up nine wins, finish the season strong. What did this year say about what the hiring of Marcus Freeman has done for Notre Dame culture? Yeah, it's it's certainly interesting. There was a ton of excitement when he was hired last or not last, but um in December of, of twenty twenty one that would have been. Um and going into the Fiesta Bowl being being named the head coach already prior to that and being taking over that staff. Um, for that game, replacing Brian Kelly, who left for LSU, and then Notre Dame comes out of the gates just blazing and and is beaten up on Oklahoma State, and then just gives up a huge lead in a, in a really tough loss, and so that I think sa- sort of soured the honeymoon for Marcus Freeman a little bit. Um, he was able to re ignite that with with some big recruiting wins in the off season, and then you come out of the gate for the twenty twenty two season and lose. At Ohio State, which I think is acceptable, Um, it was a close game. Ohio State pulled away late, um, but Notre Dame certainly could have won that game. But then you lose the next week to Marshall, and it's like, whoa, what what did we get ourselves into here? Um, And that that was a really tough loss, Um, a game that, honestly, Marshall deserved to win. Marshall played better than Notre Dame for much of the game. Notre Dame had a chance to to come back in that game and, and, and could have certainly won it, but... Marshall seemingly outplayed Notre Dame for the majority of it. And that was a real wake up call. Like, Oh boy, what's going on here. And then, like you said, the following week against Cal, it was, it was a nail biter and uh, Cal had a, a Hail Mary attempt at the end of the game. Um, Notre Dame won, wins 24 to 17. So it, 
it was a definitely a tough start. Um, I think there were some impressive victories when you go to North Carolina, B- BYU, and then and then you hit the hiccup again when you play against Stanford and lose to Stanford. And Stanford was bad last year, and so that is not a, a, an acceptable loss. Notre Dame could not score any points, just fourteen points in in in, in losing to Stanford, um, and so. A lot of head scratching after that. Notre Dame sort of recovers and, and rips off a bunch of wins, including that win over Clemson, as you mentioned. Um, and then obviously at at USC to end the regular season, um, a very good USC team. Notre Dame just didn't have enough firepower to win that game. So it was it's interesting. I think I think it sort of highlighted some of maybe Marcus Freeman's deficiencies as a first time head coach. He's never been a head coach at any level before. Um, so he's working through this job and the role and what what it what it entails how to how to make a difference as a head coach as compared to a linebackers coach or a defensive coordinator and I think that I I think a lot of people are like oh man I don't know I think some of the confidence that Notre Dame fans had in Marcus Freeman certainly decreased after last season but I think there's reasons to believe that it, it can be better I think people understand this is his first year as a head coach um, but I think certainly there's questions about his coaching acumen and what he can do in terms of being a difference maker uh, on game days, how he's preparing the team. Like if you're losing to teams that you're not supposed to lose to, like what what is going on in the preparation that is not allowing Notre Dame to be in a better, better position to sort of come out and and play well from the jump um, and sort of make it not not a tough game against those those lesser opponents. So I think. The upside of Marcus Freeman remains his ability as a recruiter. Notre Dame has one of the top five recruiting classes in the country for the 2024 class currently. I think there's a lot of off the field stuff that people are wondering about, and it's not necessarily Marcus Freeman's fault or within his control. It's like Notre Dame's sort of choice in sort of not pushing for a collective to be making these upfront agreements with, with recruits and transfers um, and, and those sort of NIL deals that are probably against the rules, but are happening all over the place. Um, And then Notre Dame has a pretty strict transfer policy that really limits its ability to bring in underclassmen transfers. They're pretty good at bringing in grad transfers and they can bring in some guys that are freshmen coming off of a freshman year because the, the academic credit transfer issue isn't as big of a deal when you're that early in your career, but there's, there's some, there's some obstacles there that Notre Dame has yet to sort of totally smooth out and make made it more achievable and attainable. And at the level that many other schools across the country are using the transfer portal. So it, it's, it's interesting because Marcus Freeman is like this big answer for Notre Dame as in terms of a recruiter, because Brian Kelly was a good recruiter, not a great recruiter. And Marcus Freeman can maybe be the difference in helping Notre Dame get elite guys. But are these new aspects of college football recruiting and, and the portal, are those maybe holding Marcus Freeman's ability to sort of maximize that back? So there's a lot going on here here in South Bend and Notre Dame in terms of what, what Marcus Freeman's future looks like and, and where the program stands. And it's going to be a very interesting season for Notre Dame with some certainly big games on the schedule. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about transfer transfer portals and difficulties within that. But I think one of the highlights of Notre Dame's offseason is landing a guy like Sam Hartman, who yeah. it looked like 12 months ago, his football career was close to over with what was going on um, off the field with that condition. I, I don't have the exact name, so I'm not going to speak for him on that. But he comes back. He's able to have a pretty solid year. And I think in the last couple of years, Hartman's been one of the better ACC quarterbacks. So he transfers to a Notre Dame. What was that process like? How did the Notre Dame come to mind for Sam Harmon? Was that the writing always on the wall for that? I talked to a rivals writer, Wake Forest, saying that Notre Dame and Sam Harmon were a match made, was already going to happen even before the bowl game was played for Wake Forest. It was a done deal. What was the process like to get Sam Hartman up to South Bend? And what's the excitement level for getting a quarterback like him to potentially boost this team to a new height, like you said? Yeah, that that injury that you mentioned, he had he had a blood clot of some sort, and uh, the syndrome I think is Paget Schroeder. I'm not exactly sure if I'm saying that right, um, but he, he he had an injury 
um, was able to recover in time that included removing a rib. And that's become a bit of a story where he, he has kept that rib that was removed and he, his, his mom is working on making that into a necklace for him. Um, but yeah, Sam Hartman, Wait, and it, <laughs> yes, as, as bizarre as that sound, that, that is, that is a true story. Uh, Sam Hartman is, is having the rib that was removed from him because of this blood clot issue, uh, turned into a necklace it, we have yet to, it, it is not a complete project yet. So we'll, we'll have to see what that looks like, but project um, certainly award for it. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, Sam Hartman coming to Notre Dame. I mean, it depends who you ask and who's going to admit what and how it all came together. But yeah, I mean, um, Connor O'Neill, who who covers Wake Forest for here for us here at Rivals, he he reported before the Wake Forest bowl game that hey, yeah, Sam Hartman's playing tonight, but this is going to be his last game at Wake Forest, which I think everyone knew. I think the, the decision was going to be whether Sam Hartman was going to the NFL or transferring. But not only was it going to be his last game at Wake Forest, but he was going to end up at, at Notre Dame and and he had not been in the portal yet. He eventually gets into the portal, makes a visit to Notre Dame, and then everything follows through and Connor O'Neill was all over that for us. Um, so I, I, I think that certainly there had to be some sort of communication and, and I think Sam Hartman sort of probably knew the opportunity that was waiting at Notre Dame, like Notre Dame had a big time quarterback going into last season, Tyler Buckner, and he got hurt um, in that second game of the season against Marshall um, and missed most of the year. He ended up playing in the bowl game against South Carolina. Um, and so there was this sort of opening there, like Notre Dame didn't sort of take advantage of its opportunity um, last season because of its quarterback situation. Drew Pine was the backup who was okay, but not a great quarterback. Um, and Notre Dame didn't want to go into another season without a, a better shot at, at, at having a stacked quarterback room and now because it did that and got Sam Hartman and then Tyler Buckner after spring decides to leave and now he's down at Alabama followed offense coordinator Tommy Reese down there so Hartman is someone that Notre Dame is very excited about um certainly they were aware that the possibility of like if he comes in that they're going to lose Tyler Buckner that is sort of the risk that Notre Dame is willing to take because they feel that the ceiling is that high for for Sam Hartman and what he can do for Notre Dame this year um, and I think a lot of the fans are excited to see what he looks like. He sort of changes what the offense can be. What one of Notre Dame's biggest deficiencies last year was its ability to stretch the field. And I think there's all kinds of analytics that point to what Sam, what Sam Hartman did in terms of throwing the ball downfield is like way beyond what other other quarterbacks in the college football were was it, were attempting last year. Um, so that is something that Notre Dame fans are excited about. The wide receiver group at Notre Dame wasn't great last season. Um, there's some guys that that Notre Dame fans are interested to see sort of taking the next step, and you would imagine that Sam Hartman being their quarterback will, will go a long way in helping them do that. Yeah, and certainly I was in Wake Forest for their matchup against Clemson, and it felt like all they did, and that was in part to the secondary deficiency that Clemson faced with at right. the beginning of the season, but – Hartman, all he did was light it up, and he he was throwing down the field. At A.T. Perry got nonstop. That was a game that really displayed his showcase. And I think that mm-hmm. was his second game back from the blood clot, if I'm not mistaken. But regardless of that, it should be an exciting year for Hartman. So with him getting accustomed to Notre Dame and being in South Bend, besides Hartman, what does the rest of the team look like in the spring? What's the energy like? And how has Freeman really adjusted to his second year as the Notre Dame head football coach? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a team that, I, I mean, in a, in a lot of the years that Notre Dame has been good in recent memory, if you talk about Notre Dame going to the BCS championship game and getting stomped by Alabama in 2012, the defense was the, the linchpin of that team. Notre Dame in 2018 and 2020, when it makes runs to the college ball playoff, the defense was strong both of those seasons. I'm not sure that the defense is the strength of this team going into the season uh, for Notre Dame. Now, maybe it can be. I think there's just a lot of questions in terms of the defense of who's going to be, who's going to provide the pass rush. They lost a lot of pass rush um, production from last season, most notably Isaiah Foskey, who was the school's all time leading sack uh, getter. Um, so who's going to step up on the D line. The secondary has some young guys that, particularly Benjamin Morrison, who was a freshman last year, was a freshman All-American. This he the the sky is the limit for him. He's a guy that 
Um, folks are very excited about safety has been an issue for Notre Dame. So that was something that Notre Dame tried to address in the transfer portal. Antonio Carter out of Rhode Island um, is someone that Notre Dame has brought in to compete there. Um, the other cornerback spot, Cam Hart, who went into last season sort of being like, okay, this could be his sort of NFL audition. And then he had an issue, didn't play that well, had a shoulder injury. Um, and his health will be very important for Notre Dame moving forward. So the defense is a lot of question marks. The offense, less so. I mean, it, it, the offense's biggest question marks are those receivers, like I mentioned, um, that don't have a, like a long history of production, but there is a lot of potential there. The offensive tackles are the, are part of the strength, obviously, beyond the quarterback position. Joe Walt and Blake Fisher. Joe Walt's an All-American already. Blake Fisher is someone that many people believe will be a future All-American. Just uh, He was injured as a freshman and then had a decent year last year as a sophomore. And then the running back position is strong with Audrick Estime returning. Notre Dame took a hit there with Logan Diggs, who was sort of 1B to Audrick Estime's 1A, um, entering the transfer portal and and joining Brian Kelly down at LSU is in his home state. Um, so that was a loss there, but Notre Dame has addressed that um, with bringing in more guys at the position, including Penn State uh, transfer Devin Ford. Um, so the there's an excitement around what this offense can become. I think – there's a little bit of unknown there with Notre Dame's offensive coordinator uh, situation because Jared Parker was hired uh, or promoted to Notre Dame's offensive coordinator was the tight ends coach prior to that has had uh, has worked with Marcus Freeman before that led to him ended up bring being brought in as the tight ends coach. Um, and then Notre Dame had sort of a public um, misfire in its offensive coordinator search with it really, really, really wanted Utah's Andy Ludwig brought him on a campus. He was even at a hockey game publicly. People saw him um, and just, they just were not able to come to a deal. Um, and that, uh, and there's all kinds of debate about how that went down and why did Notre Dame not, why wasn't Notre Dame able to make that happen? Um, and so some people think that Notre Dame sort of settled for Jared Parker rather than going out and get the best guy available. Um, and so there's unknown about what Jared Parker can do as an offensive coordinator. He doesn't have a long track record of play calling, um, he held the title of offensive coordinator um, uh, at West Virginia, but was not the full-time play caller. Uh, and so that's uh, a big, going to be a big learning curve for Jared Parker going into the season. Certainly when you have a quarterback like Sam Harmon, that you would think that would make that easier. But, but I think, so we're, we don't really know exactly what the offense is going to look like. We think the offense is going to stretch the ball down the field a little bit more because of Sam Hartman, and that seems to be the case. But we do believe that the offense will still be um, a bit run first and run heavy because of its running back situation and its offensive line. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns. I think that I don't, I don't know that there's going to be anything, anything crazy that we see from Notre Dame out in the field. It's like, oh, I would have never expected that. But I think there's not – it, it's it's not exactly guaranteed that everything looks sort of the same with of the Notre Dame that, that many people are used to seeing. It's going to be interesting, too, especially with the schedule that the Irish have this year. They're going to be playing Ohio State yet again. They have USC on the schedule. They're coming to Death Valley for Clemson. They're going to play a sneaky Duke team that won nine games last year. And like you said, they're going to be starting a little earlier than everybody else playing in Ireland in week one. So what looking at your schedule, is there anything – looking at Notre Dame schedule is there anything that you've circled on the calendars potentially not maybe something that I've mentioned that you could see being a difficult challenge for the Irish but maybe you're like oh USC is going to be our real tell Ohio State in September is going to be our tell what's been your impression of the schedule for Notre Dame yeah it's interesting not only does Notre Dame start early but it chose not to take a bye week after Notre Dame returns from the Navy game in Ireland um, that next week they will play a game against Tennessee State an HBCU school be Notre Dame's first game uh, against a, a, a non FBS program in its entire history. Um, so that uh, is a big, I, that is an interesting decision. I, I don't think that Notre Dame really risked a chance of losing to Tennessee state, but I think maybe where that catches up to Notre Dame is that the third week of the season where you haven't had a time off and you're going out to NC state, which NC state can give some teams trouble, especially as a home team. Um, so I'm curious what Notre Dame looks like, but it, in theory, is it's a pretty good build up to the Ohio State game last year. Notre Dame opened at Ohio State, and given that Notre Dame had a first year quarter, first year starter at quarterback in Tyler Buckner, that was a that was a tough ask 
and Notre Dame is sort of going to be able to ease into the schedule a little bit. I don't know that Navy's going to be a real challenge for Notre Dame. Like I said, Tennessee State won't. NC State will be interesting to see sort of, okay, has the way that this schedule started impacted Notre Dame in any way? Um, and are is Notre Dame sort of firing at all cylinders by then? Um, and then they play Central Michigan before that Ohio State game. The Duke game that you highlighted, I think, is an interesting one because that's right after the Ohio State game as well. You go on the road to Duke, which Notre Dame has had plenty of success in the past there, but this Duke team is different. Duke is certainly familiar with, or Notre Dame is familiar with Mike Elko. Mike Elko was a defensive coordinator at Notre Dame um, previously. So I think there's some familiarity there, although there's been plenty of staff changeover since then. Um, getting USC at home, getting at getting USC in Notre Dame stadium, I think is a help, but I think certainly Caleb Williams is probably the one spot that you feel like for sure. Notre Dame doesn't have the best quarterback on the field. Um, I think I think throughout the rest of the season, there, there's a good chance that Notre Dame does. Um, now, obviously, that depends on whether Ohio State's quarterbacks can um, live up to their expectations, whether Cade Klubnick can live up to the expectation at Clemson. Um, but it's 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 interesting. The, the bye weeks are sort of later. There there there's two two bye weeks because they didn't take that one at the beginning of the season. So there's one in uh, late October, October 20, October 21st, which is after the USC game. And there's a week, there's a bye week after the Clemson game. I think in a perfect world, you'd probably prefer those to be before those games uh, <laughs> to get some extra time to prepare for those teams. Um, so it's a, it's sort of a fascinating schedule and a, a bit of an odd one. Um, and uh, we'll certainly provide plenty of challenges for Notre Dame. Yeah. And you talk about certain quarterbacks living up to expectations. We're going to get into that in just a second, but we're also going to start talking about defining expectations for Notre Dame and this has been a constant theme throughout the series as I like to finish with two central questions of how does this program define their expectations and then we get your take on Clemson but just to start how does this Notre Dame program that they're two years removed I guess three years at this point removed from a CFP appearance they had been the CFP in 2018 in the last year of a 14 playoff before it expands, and in my opinion, it's going to get easier for a lot of these fringe playoff teams that have had struggles being maybe making their case with it being four. I can see a Notre Dame team being a consistent appearance. Yep. Excuse me, making a consistent appearance in the 12 team playoff, especially as an independent. They're not in a conference, so they're not getting that extra win in a conference championship. With this kind of schedule, if they can go their way, they certainly can make their case as a 14 playoff. Is that the expectation in South Bend, or is it maybe easing into that and maybe just holding the pause button until we get to the 12-team playoff? I think with what Brian Kelly was able to do with the program, and certainly he wasn't able to win a national championship at Notre Dame, but he put the expectations back to, okay, Notre Dame should be competing to be in the playoff on an annual basis. I don't know that it's – I mean, in, they'd like to be able to say that they're competing for a national championship on an annual basis, but I think you got to at least win one before you can say you're doing that on an annual basis. Um, and they haven't done that in my lifetime and I am 34 years old now. Um, so I think that Notre Dame expects to be able to compete for the playoff. I think a lot of years based on Notre Dame schedule, sometimes Notre Dame probably looking at it like, if okay, if we go undefeated, we're going to get in the playoff. If we're a one loss team, there's always the concern. It's like, well, we don't have a conference championship game, so will that be held against us? We can't get that extra significant win, although sometimes they feel like you're the Big Ten. It might not be a significant win when you're playing <laughs> Iowa or Northwestern in the in the Big Ten championship. Um, so I think certainly with this schedule, Notre Dame could lose one game and still get in, in my opinion, as long as one of those games – well, I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if Notre Dame lost to – say NC state, but beat Ohio state at USC and Clemson. I think you'd still have to make the case that Notre Dame d belongs in the playoff at that point. But so I, 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 I think that remains the expectation. Now, will Notre Dame be able to get there? I, I don't know. I think this is probably a 10 and two team. Um, I think it's hard to say with certainty that Notre Dame can win the majority of those three games and, and maybe they get caught up in one of those other spots that I mentioned as, as maybe trouble spots. And especially with the way the Notre Dame team played last year, that a trouble spot can be any game. I think it's hard to sort of just count everything as a win when you go through the schedule. Um, so I think that that would be where, sort of what my prediction is. But yeah, I think the expectation, especially within the fan base, is 
we want to be in the playoff and we want to compete for that national championship. Obviously, competing for it and winning it are different things. Um, but I think especially when you bring in a quarterback like Sam Hartman, you're sort of pushing your chips to the middle and saying, hey, you're only getting Sam Hartman for one year. So was it like Notre Dame fans who are skeptics can be like, well, if we're not going to win the national championship, why did we chase off Tyler Buckner to bring in Sam Hartman for in for one year? And so Marcus Freeman, he's like, hey, we want to we want to compete and, and try to win a national championship. And, and bringing in Sam Hartman is the best way forward for that. Um, and so I think that raises the stakes, even though the stakes are always very high um, at Notre Dame. Stakes are high indeed. And I think a fun way to close us off is we've done this for every part in the series is that it's different when I have my perspective, my takes on the Clemson football program, talking to maybe students on campus, coaches who see are living in the program, living and breathing it. But it's also neat to get the perspective from the outside, talking to guys in Miami, Wake Forest, Notre Dame. So Clemson's lost six, six games in their last two seasons from 2015 to 2020 when they made the playoffs every year. They were combined seven losses with four of those in the postseason. One of those six losses in these last two years was to a Notre Dame team that Clemson fans, I think, fairly enough felt that they shouldn't have too much trouble with given the, the losses on the schedule to a Marshall and a Stanford. And Notre Dame comes in and rolls them. It, besides the, the loss, it was a pleasure to be able to come to South Bend to be able to cover that game. But it was a loss that pretty opened the eyes to a lot of Clemson fans saying, man, this something needs to change. The 35-14 loss. So in your eyes in the last two years, what has it been about Clemson where they've struggled? Obviously, DJ Uyungale hasn't lived up to expectations in filling the shoes of Trevor Lawrence. Cade Klubnick comes in. Garrett Riley is the new offensive coordinator. There's a new energy, it feels like, with this football program. Where is this program headed in your eyes? And what, what has it been like seeing this rocky last couple of years for Clemson football? Yeah, Clemson has been a fascinating program to watch. I, I, I've been covering Notre Dame since 2012, so I made the trip out to Clemson back in 2015, which was, I think you could probably say it was maybe start at the start of the, the Clemson dynasty when Notre Dame was, or Clemson was able to beat Notre Dame and, and things really started to feel special at, at Clemson around then. Um, but I feel like these last couple of years, Clemson hasn't necessarily had those difference makers. Uh, obviously, when you look beyond Trevor Lawrence, the quarterback position hasn't been able to reach that, which I mean, no one was having quarterback play quite like Clemson when you go from Deshaun Watson to, to Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> But I think that that uh, certainly you started the quarterback position. I think the wide receiver position seems like a position that hasn't had those difference makers, which certainly wasn't the case in previous years. And the defensive line, I think, has been good, but not maybe as great as it once was. Um, and so I think – and then you mentioned the secondary, which was a real trouble point for Clemson last year. Um, so I just think there's been there's been more holes within the Clemson – blueprint than there was in previous years and i i know clemson clemson is a different program too like clemson doesn't necessarily embrace the transfer portal clemson will sometimes recruit smaller um recruiting classes because of that it doesn't expect guys to leave the program um and isn't necessarily going for numbers but tries to get quality but if you missed on some of those five-star guys then maybe you're in a bad position because you didn't recruit a lot of guys beyond those guys so i think i i think it Notre Dame and Clemson are very similar um, in uh, there may be a lot of different ways. There may be a lot of things different about the two programs, but I think sort of their paths to success are like sort of having to thread the needle a little bit. And uh, Dabo Sweeney obviously did a great job of doing that in that five or six year run. But I think you see sort of how maybe thin that line can be for, for a program that's trying to do that in different ways than maybe some of the other programs are doing it. So I think that certainly I believe that Clemson could get back to where it was. Um, I think from a Notre Dame perspective, Clemson became this sort of intimidating program. And I think in the last few years, it didn't. I, obviously, the 2020 season was was strange in many ways. But Notre Dame or Clemson comes into Notre Dame without Trevor Lawrence for that game. Notre Dame beats them and then obviously loses in the ACC championship game, which is a weird sentence to say, covering Notre Dame. <laughs> and uh, – and then obviously the last season, Clemson was sort of outplayed from the start in that game, and Notre Dame really pulled away and and sort of imposed its will uh, on Clemson. And Clemson, 
Obviously, I think also has always had room to improve on his offensive line, but is it able to sort of get away with that with some of its skill talent? Um, and that's obviously something that Notre Dame prides itself on is the offensive line and maybe sorts of gets away with skill talent that isn't sort of elite at the same level as some other programs. So um, it's it'll be fascinating to see what how Clemson recovers from last season. Certainly there's plenty of programs in college football that would love for Clemson's 2022 to be considered a down season. Um, but that's the, that's the level that Clemson has built itself to. Um, and this is going to be probably a very, a very telling year about the health of the Clemson program. And if, if the blueprint that Dabo Sweeney put in place is still as viable as it once was. Certainly should be. And uh, it's uh, we, we talk about how most programs would trade that 10 and three season orange bowl loss to Tennessee, Tennessee go, man, we'd love for that. <laughs> Right. This kind of shows you the perspective to go along with that. But that'll do it for today uh, with uh, Inside Notre Dame Sports, Tyler James. Tyler, thank you so much. Do you have any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up our uh, show today? No, I'm looking forward to the season, certainly heading back to Clemson. Hopefully we have better weather than the last time I was there. I didn't get to check out much of campus because it was downpouring the whole time, but uh, hoping hoping we get some better weather there. Um, and it's it's nice to get out of South Bend in November, which I'm sure Clemson fans are, are glad that they're not heading to, to South Bend in November. <laughs> yeah, that, that travel was a little brutal. But, guys, thank you so much for listening to Tyler James' interview, Breaking Down Notre Dame Football. We're super thankful for all the support you've shown on this Clemson football preview series. We'll have Part 8, Part 7, and 8 releasing next week. I'm recording this on Saturday, July 15th, so expect one on July 19th and July 21st, featuring Notre Dame and Georgia Tech. Thank you, as always, for the support on the podcast in general. Let's try to get to 22,000 listeners by, let's say, the end of July. Guys, thank you so much. Have a great day, and take care. Mm-hmm.